I mean, sorry, uh, presentation uh, being done uh, remotely, virtually. So I think it'll be good to start on time so that uh, we also finish on time. Biradji, if you can please, <laughs> sorry to take a seat, but to come forward and take a seat, it'll be very helpful. Well, uh, the next session now uh, is on uh, gener uh, generating science-based scenarios and planning process for 100% renewable energy. This is the session where the scenarios for 100% renewable uh, energy will be discussed. There are a few countries, in fact, many countries who have done the scenarios, how they can really move into the, you know, looking into the future of 100% renewable energy. As uh, in the, yesterday in the beginning of the session we said, this is more of a future vision, looking at a more at a high end, how we can really achieve that. But there, there could be a lot of, uh, many milestones on the way to achieving 100% renewable energy. But what the scenario really says, based on different analysis or the modeling that has been really done, we have also done it for Nepal. There was a case also done for countries like Bangladesh, Tanzania, Uganda, and others. So we will uh, share this, uh, this, some of the findings here. We'll also have the experience from uh, India, who's done this planning process as well. So in order to moderate this session, let me invite uh, Salma, the project manager of the World Future Council, uh, please on the, in the front and then uh, take over this session. So now I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Salma. Thank you very much, Raju. <laughs> now it's working. Um, before I start this session, I would briefly like to um, tell you about the structure of the session so we can follow the time also. So we would first start with a scene setting presentation from Sven, who is joining us remotely. We would then move on to the panel discussion and later open also um, the panel for Q&As. So I would kind of like to invite you to throughout the session, write down your questions or also opinion or experiences in case you ha want to share any to um, still have enough time later on. So for the technical scenario, of course, and to, be, to, to develop a technical scenario that's also suitable for policies and to implement um, policies that are suitable for the geographic, economic, and financial situation in each country, it is very, very important to develop like a research base, uh, to, to appro follow a research-based um, approach and a science-based approach. And therefore, I would like to start our session by introducing to you Sven Teske, who will give us the scene setting um, presentation about the methodology and the background of developing a technical scenario. But before I give him the floor, I would like to introduce to you Sven Teske very quickly. <laughs> So, Dr. Dr. Sven Teske is an, an associate professor and research director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures um, uh, at the University of Technology in Sydney, with a research focus on energy decarbonization pathways for sp uh, specific industry sectors and regions toward net zero by 2020, 2050. Dr. Teske has over 28 years' experience in the renewable energy market and policy analysis, as well as solar and on and offshore wind power grid integration concepts in public grids. Dr. Teske published over 50 special reports about renewable energies, including 100% renewable energy for Nepal, which he is still, it is still in the final stage, but it was developed in this year, in 2022. Dr. Sven Teske, if you can hear me, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Selma. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, have, I have to apologize that I have to um, join remotely, uh, but I hopefully uh, I can still get the message uh, across. Um, I would like to share my screen now to jump straight into um, the presentation. So um, can you see the presentation? Yes, I should be OK. Um, in order to um, start the, um, the discussion, I was first I would like to um, go through the different steps of our work. 
Um, we go from mapping uh, basically the, the resources um, in Nepal in terms of solar and wind uh, power generation to uh, the bottom-up demand projection for households and industries, a bottom-up demand projection for transport, um, based on that um, development of a long-term energy scenario from the uh, from first from the demand side and then from the supply side. And then we dive a bit deeper into power sector analysis where we um, simulated the, um, uh, the projected electricity supply um, in, in 2030, 2040, and 2050 uh, for Nepal in a more... Uh, in an hourly resolution in order to um, see to what extent uh, storage equipment is required, storage technologies. Um, and then I um, go into the different key results uh, for all the different uh, work packages. So maybe to start, um, we actually, uh, during the process of uh, the work over the past about 12 months, uh, we merged four uh, different um, module, modules or mod, uh, modules of the model into um, two. We merged the transport model, the uh, overall energy system model, and the power system model into one MATLAB-based model, um, which uh, has the advantage that we don't need to transfer data from one model to the other. That means we have far more interaction. Uh, we have far more um, detail analysis where we um, immediately get a result for a specific change, let's say in the transport sector or in the residential area or in the industry sector. So we basically have a better interconnection. And the better interconnection means that we uh, react quicker. We can uh, see um, changes uh, for different assumptions uh, earlier and uh, we can also um, describe them better. So um, the first step of, I could also, that's a bit artificial, we could also do it um, um, uh, saying uh, uh, the, the third or fourth step. So first we did the re renewable resource assessment. Um, this is uh, an old map, we actually changed it. Um, I have to, in another um, 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 slide, I changed the map, that was a wrong map. So what we do, we do is uh, we have a re renewable space assessment based on a geographic information system uh, where we basically uh, look at uh, the land availability. Um, if we subtract residential urban settlements, infrastructure for transport, industrial areas and, and agricultural production, nature conservation areas and wetlands. So basically we break down here the, um, the regional um, energy potential by province. Um, we look at maps, um, uh, we look at the, um, the uh, potential, both in terms of the um, solar, renewable energy solar potential, also in wind potential, um, and then uh, calculate the amount of um, output and of its total capacity uh, for um, um, a specific region. So I'll give an example, um, for example, we, uh, we looked into um, the uh, uh, specific uh, region around, let's say, uh, the city of Kathmandu, uh, we are able to locate um, specific areas uh, where there is no conflict of, um, of land use, at least from the theoretical point of view. And uh, we calculate then the uh, amount of uh, solar um, utility scale solar potential. So all the yellow dots are the uh, potentials which were basically are uh, in theory suitable for utility scale solar. Um, in the next step, then we uh, look how far the um, transmission lines and the distribution power lines are actually uh, away from that spot. And the further away, the less likelihood um, we um, assume uh, they get used because uh, the, the grid extension takes time and it also costs money. So um, uh, if we do, if we put all this together, um, we are able to say how many square kilometers of um, area uh, in theory are um, available for utility scale solar and what, uh, what um, installed capacity um, has space in that, basically in that, that area. 
And this is just a first rough indicated, uh, indic indicative figure, which, need, which needs to be refined, obviously, further. Because um, the first, in the first view, we see that the, the actual installed capacity or the potential in different provinces is very large. In some uh, provinces, Lam Lumbini, for example, very large. Um, so um, there is no um, the theoretical bottleneck of uh, not having enough space. Um, we basically put all those maps together uh, and they are available online. And uh, you can actually click into the maps and zoom in and see uh, the specific um, data for a very specific area. So that's a very high resolution. Um, in the report, there are only JPEGs, uh, so on, only pictures. But uh, if you click those links, you can actually um, see um, very detailed uh, what the, uh, the situation, what the potential is in a specific location. Um, this is for, uh, that's an example, it's a screenshot. And um, if you click on one of the power lines here, there's a window pops up um, and uh, you can see what the name of the power line is, what the length of the power line is and the status. So this is basically um, a, a, an additional information system about planning and about uh, a sort of expanding infrastructure in the future and uh, which we have taken into account in our planning. Um, the second step uh, for the demand or the first step in the demand analysis is the demand projection for households and industry. So uh, the, the current situation uh, in Nepal is uh, uh, an, an analyzed and we basically took information from the Department of Economic and Social Affair, Affairs and, and from, uh, from uh, government um, agencies in Nepal, but also from the United Nations in our whole um, analysis. So basically, we have a, um, a breakdown of the different households and a breakdown of what um, socioeconomic situation, what kind of equipment um, is available currently and uh, in the future. So, for example, a rural household currently in Nepal on average uh, has a uh, demand of about 337 uh, kilowatt hours a year. And uh, we identify very clearly what kind of application I use right, no right now. And then we um, develop in the second sta stage how um, or what is desirable for the household um, application. How do the, the, um, the, how those households uh, expand? And uh, with more application, for example, for a sort of a, a washing machine, a fridge, a freezer or whatever, um, what electricity demand is then uh, required for a household and for the whole, and what would that mean for the whole region? So uh, we define the household different types. Um, then we identify um, the percentage um, of um, households in the specific region. So 75% of a specific household type is, is currently in a region. That's just an example. Um, and then we identify that um, the the uh, rural household will get more have more equipment and move a bit further into um, the phase two. That means then in ten years time, uh, three percent or four percent of the household moved from uh, phase one to phase two, and uh, another uh, three percent then moved from uh, uh, phase two to a phase three. So basically, this is the way how we can model. Um, a specific development of uh, demand in a household or in different households uh, um, and what would that mean for the whole country and for the whole region. Um, secondly, um, we identified industrial areas um, um, and um, in, in specific categ uh, statistical categories and um, the Industry sectors are obviously currently not uh, very large in, in Nepal, but the service um, um, industries are quite large, uh, uh, as well as the transport sector. So we break the different demands, the different uh, projections uh, further down into very specific detailed um, industry demands. Um, in terms of transport, um, we uh, again, we use um, currently um, um, sort of survey data and census data of um, the current use of uh, vehicles. 
um, then we uh, identify, uh, have a, a whole set of technical uh, data for each vehicle, for each vehicle type. And um, then we project, for example, that um, that the passenger kilometers right now, so one person travels X kilometers a day or X kilometers a year um, in right now uh, with a specific vehicle. How would the energy demand change if the vehicle changes? So, for example, if uh, a person would uh, travel not by bus anymore um, or by a motorcycle, uh, but by a private uh, vehicle, or, uh, or will, um, or what the effect? What, what is the effect if all the vehicles will move from, let's say, um, um, fossil fuel based or so petrol? Um, to electricity, what would be the electricity demand? Um, so this is a very specific bottom-up analysis where we look into the demand in terms of um, traveling, in terms of kilometers, or in terms of transported ton tons uh, of goods, and uh, what the energy demand, energy supply requirement would be to change the vehicle from one to the other. Um, so um, this is um, our um, um, transport demand projection uh, for passenger and freight transports. I'm not going into details. I, I just put this in uh, for um, documentation reasons, but this is all uh, documented in the report. Um, the, um, the fourth step is the long-term energy scenario, which basically means we have all the different demand assumptions and all the demand trajectories. We put this, this together. Um, we have, therefore, the energy demand trajectory development of Nepal broken down by the provinces um, between now and 2050 and five year steps. And we can um, then um, um, see the influence of population development um, and economic growth. We um, use the population, um, the currently population from the new census. And, and the the, um, um, the projection of uh, government at slash United Nations. So basically, uh, we assume that the until 2050, basically our uh, projection time for for this scenario, that the population in Nepal will still increase. And uh, again, this is uh, the assumption for uh, the socio-economic development, so population growth and GDP growth. Uh, we use the same GDP growth projections as um, um, used in the government scenarios, in the reference uh, and uh, in the uh, WEM scenario, so in the, with, uh, uh, with existing measures scenario. So we, um, we just um, use the same economic development in order to be able to compare our scenario directly with the existing scenarios. Once we developed the energy scenario, we did the power sector analysis, as I um, already said, and that means um, we are moving now into the, this uh, block here. And uh, the way it works is um, we develop a load profile for all the different provinces, for each of the seven provinces, um, and uh, model the load uh, profile and the supply via um, the specific energy mix, which I will come to in a minute. So a mix of, uh, of hydropower, solar, and a little bit of wind, not much. Um, how do we actually um, balance this? And to what extent do we actually need transport from one province, uh, electricity, uh, to transport electricity from one pro province to the other? Um, in terms of the, uh, the actual simulation, uh, we basically have, have in, the, in the top, we have the load. So what is required, uh, let's say, to a certain time on a certain day. So we, we model every hour of the year, so 8,760 hours. Um, so we have on a specific day and uh, time, we have a, a load. Um, that goes basically into the modeling system. Then uh, we use... Um, First, for example, solar um, to, to um, supply the load, um, it's not enough. Um, the next technology, and we can change uh, the, 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 the order of different technologies in order to see how we can 
um, use the different projected um, power plant fleets in order to supply the electricity on an hourly basis. Um, in terms of the results, and that's probably uh, uh, more interesting uh, in this context here, um, we modeled several scenarios. So we modeled basically the re remodeled the two um, uh, government scenario, and we develop uh, one new one. Uh, the key assumptions for the um, scenario develop development is that we have scenarios to, uh, po policy stability, uh, that we have strengthened energy and efficiency policies, um, that the uh, role of uh, the utilities of the energy utilities will change a bit uh, in order to um, use more decentralized um, power generation and microgrids. Um, that we uh, assume that the population GDP development in all uh, three scenarios is, are the same, um, and they are taken from the um, Nepal's second national, nationally determined contribution, and uh, that we always have firm capacity in order to supply the demand. And um, we also um, identify the cost assumptions for specific technologies and fuel. Um, the, we compare our key results with the reference scenario. Basically, the reference scenario is the, uh, the long-term strategy for net zero emissions um, uh, published uh, from the government uh, of Nepal in October 2021. Um, and with the um, scenario, with the existing measure scenarios, uh, which is taken from the same publication, um, and uh, we remodeled basically both scenarios in order, in order to um, put the new scenario into a context and to compare it with each other. So in terms of the, the um, final energy demand, uh, the, uh, the new scenario, we call it simply the 1.5 degree scenario, is um, relatively similar to, uh, in terms of demand uh, in, uh, to the um, WEM scenario. Um, it is a bit more ambitious in electrification, um, especially on the, in the transport sector, but also for cooking. And that is why we have, in terms of final energy demand, less energy demand than uh, the um, WEM scenario and um, significantly less than the reference case. The service, or basically the energy services are similar, but electrification is usually more efficient um, and therefore, uh, the, the final energy demand for a specific service is lower. So it's, it's not uh, if the final energy demand is lower, it doesn't mean that we um, transport less, for example. It's just, it just means that uh, we, we use the, the energy more efficient. And in terms of transport, an example, an internal combustion engine has an uh, has a efficiency from fuel to, uh, to the tire, to the wheel, um, of about 30%, while um, the elect electric vehicle has about 90%. So uh, therefore, there, there's uh, much um, a, lo a lot less or fewer losses. Um, important, obviously, uh, in this calculation is that the electricity generation is also efficient and uh, uh, will come from renewable energy sources or hydro. Um, so here, the, the, um, the electricity demand by sector is shown. You see, while we have uh, far less uh, final energy, we actually have a significantly more um, electric demand, electric uh, electricity demand over time. So we have about like 30% uh, more electricity demand in 2050 compared to the reference case. And uh, a very large proportion of uh, this is um, the um, the industry, but also the resi uh, the uh, residential sector. Um, in terms of final energy demand for heat, and heat is um, is both both space heating but also process heat for businesses and for industries. Um, we have. Um, Basically, uh, the efficiency here, that's sort of the gray bar compared to the reference in the uh, WEM scenario, is again a very high um, share of electrification. And um, 
In terms of the road transport energy demand for passengers and freight, um, we basically electrify the entire transport sector um, until 2050. There's on, there are only a few um, areas, a uh, few regions left where we still have internal combustion engines, but in general, all the transport will be electrified. Um, the assumption is, um, I think, relatively realistic because um, more and more countries, also the EU, for example, uh, will ban the manufacture of internal combustion engine cars. Uh, the European Union, for example, will ban uh, the manufacture of internal combustion engine cars uh, by 2035. So that means um, Nepal, with no own car industry, has, uh, has only two options, either um, taking basically the outdated models um, which are not legal actually to use anymore in many um, OECD countries or um, implement electric vehicles, new electric vehicles which are manufactured in the um, usual countries who are currently also um, work uh, and, and basically uh, dominate the manufacturing process and uh, utilize this advantage. Uh, that, but also that means that uh, the expanding the electricity um, the, uh, supply for Nepal is key to implement that. In terms of the generation, uh, from the generation side, uh, we have taken on board basically uh, the plans for um, new hydrogen power, uh, for hydropower plants um, until 2030 from the government. Um, we um, have then some sort of a limit where we do not expand any further and the additional electricity demand will come mainly from solar photovoltaics, uh, from so solar photovoltaics, a little bit from wind. There is a bit wind potential in Nepal, but it's not very large. And then we have a hydrogen uh, part as well, which uh, is only used uh, for process heat, for for processes where we really have no other option uh, to uh, electrify, and to some extent, uh, but to a very uh, small extent, also for storage reasons. But um, storage uh, hydrogen-based storage systems have extremely high losses currently, and therefore we um, use hydrogen mainly only to replace combustion processes uh, use hydrogen in processes where we need a combustion process. In terms of heat, um, we have uh, a lot of uh, electrification. We also have solar heating. We have biomass based heating um, and uh, cooking. Um, we have a specific scenario which we um, uh, documented very detailed in the report um, to to show how we actually uh, organize uh, or we suggest to organize a transition from uh, biofuel, biomass cooking um, based um, systems to electric cooking. Um, and in terms of transport, um, the, the very large amount of uh, efficiency of, of sort of uh, uh, NG um, of efficiency measures are almost entirely based on the electrification part um, with uh, the higher efficiency, what I uh, explained uh, already. In terms of the pr uh, total primary energy demand, so basically the, the carry of the, what, what kind of energy will, um, will um, be in charge to supply the, the country. So the, what, what is the basis for, for the supply? Currently, it is a lot of biomass. Um, which is very often uh, used in cooking, and the, the electricity is obviously uh, almost entirely generated uh, by um, hydropower. And um, we um, basically move towards um, a more sort of mixed system in the electricity uh, supply between solar and hydropower. We do not use natural gas um, in or coal uh, for the power generation um, and um, the um, ocean energy and nuclear, I should have deleted that. That's just a standard template. So that's uh, not used for, for primary energy supply. 
And then uh, we have also um, taken into account electricity imports and exports. Um, Sven, it's just a brief reminder that we have like five more minutes to um, for yes, you just I'm, to know. I'm Sorry. almost there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so um, the, uh, at last but not least, we calculated the, the um, CO2, the energy-related CO2 emissions, uh, which uh, we are able to uh, reduce to zero uh, by 2050. And uh, we only have a minor emission left uh, in 2040. So that's mainly uh, due to um, ambitious electrification. Um, the, the electricity supply cost um, in our scenario, we will be uh, slightly more expensive um, between 2030 and 2040 or 35. So there's a phase of seven years where the electricity is um, about two cents more expensive, two to three cents more ex expensive um, than uh, in the reference case or the, in the WEM case. But we actually go under that level uh, around 2040 or just before because um, we have uh, then implemented all the required generation capacity and we, we are able to replace fuel uh, and the fuel supply is mainly from outside of Nepal so that's actually a cost benefit and um, I'm not going into that we basically have uh, a detailed list of required investments for the different technologies um, last but not least I just wanted to um, jump into one um, slide before I uh, close. Um, we calculated the, um, the situation uh, for the electricity supply in all the different provinces. And for example, in province one in 2020 or currently, uh, there's all, only dispatchable uh, conventional renewables, which is hydro. Um, and uh, we have um, uh, variable renewables, sort of solar, almost zero. In 2030, we have 7% uh, variable renewables, mainly solar, and in 2050, already 45. Um, so we basically see that the, the structure, um, how the electricity supply is managed, um, will change. And um, we then have, um, uh, we calculated the maximum load and the uh, in terms of the demand, but also in terms of the generation and uh, the residual load, which basically is the difference between what's the, what is the load re currently um, required in the grid and what's the generation. Um, and this is basically an indication to what extent we need to uh, take into account uh, grid expansion and or storage technologies. And uh, that's sort of my one of my last slides. We um, have um, the situation here that um, in uh, Gadanki, Gadaki, sorry that I pronounced it probably wrong, uh, we have a, 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 big, a big spike of um, generation and that needs to be basically distributed into other uh, provinces. Again, more details are in the report. And uh, with this, I would like to close. I'm sorry that I have to Put, squeeze so much technical information uh, in, in a short time frame, but I just wanted to give you an overview of what you can find, and I'm always happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. Thank you for a very insightful presentation. And Sven will stay with us for the whole session, so there's still hopefully some time for um, um, topics of discussion with him. But before we move on, I want to ask you if there is any comprehension question from your side that you want to ask Sven, anything that would help you understand the technical part of the, of the presentation. We would have like three to five minutes for that. If everything is fine and understandable, I would now like to move on and present and invite the panel to join me at the stage. We have with us today Dr. Jahangir Hassan Masum. He is the Executive Director of Coastal Development Partnership. It's a national research and advocacy focused not-for-profit organization in Bangladesh. He's also the chairperson of the Reality of Aid Asia Pacific. And he's very active in the national, international development processes to promote climate justice, low carbon development, just energy transition, energy cooperation, and 100% renewable energy. 
He was also part of the facilitation of a 100% renewable energy study in Bangladesh, which was, which was conducted in 2018. And since then, he is engaged and involved in developing um, bottom-up approaches to implement this. Dr. Masum, please join the stage. I would also like to invite Ms. Arati Kadigi. She is Senior Program Officer at the of the Climate and Energy Unit at the WWF Nepal. With around 10 years of experience of working in climate change sector, she, she has an expertise in building resilience of people and ecosystems through nature-based solutions, promotion of renewable energy, and accessing climate finances. She has extensively supported in integrating climate change and renewable energy in the plans and policies of all parts of the government. She has played a significant role in successful implementation of the multi-actor partnerships for 100% renewable energy project in Nepal. Ms. Arte, please join us. And last but not least, I would like to present Dr. Manoj Kumar Mahata. He is the energy advisor at the GIZ of India. He provided technical assistance to six Indian states in developing multi-sectoral, multi-fold, data-driven, long-term and strategic energy vision, as well as energy action plans for India. Please welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to start also for the audience as an orientation. So this is now um, a discussion about the process of then implementing the technical scenario in the country after hearing of the, about the methodological approach of the technical scenario. So I would like to start with Mr. Masum. Um, with your experience of developing the technical scenario and being part of it from the beginning, please provide us with uh, uh, your, your knowledge about the process of implementing it in with the, with the aspect of Bangladesh. Thank you. Um, I think what uh, Swain just uh, presented, basically that methodology also applied in Bangladesh context. And what Swain presented, I found that is still a lot of analysis he will also present. Um, so in our perspective, first of all, we are a development organization. Uh, basically focused on advocacy. So why we have gone for a national level research? Because it was also expensive research mm, for this kind of uh, analysis and others. First of all, um, as an organization, we are involved in the climate change process since 2001. So naturally, um, after 2010, we have, we, have to, we have done basically on the adaptation issues. So then 2010, we started just, just transition, not just energy and nature, just transition. And then low carbon development to incorporate mitigation aspect also in our work. And from that perspective, uh, in 2015, when the Paris Agreement agreed, then the NDC basically forced us to look for the renewable energy option because NDC binded every country eh, to reduce their emissions. So it means that whether we are polluting or not polluting, we have to show our commitment, and this commitment will be enhanced. And in the next year, basically 2016, when there is a new forum developed, the Climate Vulnerable Forum in Marrakesh, and the Bangladesh Prime Minister was the uh, opening chair of this uh, forum, and that really motivated us to go more deeper. And then we came to know that Tanzania did a study on 100% renewable energy. And then um, when we are also working on this advocacy of renewable energy, we found that we don't have the evidence. Wherever we are going, everybody said, we don't know how much renewable energy we can produce. Where is our land? No? How you can uh, convert agricultural land into renewable energy or solar 
panel. So a lot of questions coming from both in our, I was also a skeptic whether we can go for this 100% renewable energy by 2050. This framework basically came from the Climate Vulnerable Forum Declaration. So then Tanzania study helped us and we basically tried to go for the contextual agreement with different universities. Because from that experience, when you talk to the academicians in Bangladesh, they say that this kind of uh, study needs supercomputer because of the modeling. This data, that was not really available even in our universities. So we have to go for the international level. And all the four universities that are basically available in the currently to do that, we found that um, Swain's University was the best one. So we provided that um, contact to the University of Sydney, Sydney. But here also there is a cast because as an individual organization, we are also kind of a um, particular hesitant. No, because you are giving something to the academicians and some issue that you don't know anything about. Mm. So uh, whatever the, they will tell, you have to really accept that. No? So then we basically also like, uh, have partnership with the World Future Council, Bread for the World, so that they have put their experts who are the renewable energy process. So that gives us confidence that we can move forward. So I think um, for the, even the scenario development, this multi-stakeholder partnership, multi sector partnership is very important because it will really give you confidence to move forward. Uh, and also um, what I would say that I would not say it's only science-based scenario because when we put this uh, study, we told that we want basically energy justice framework also in the analysis. That means every person has a right for minimum amount of energy required for his well-being or her well-being. So that has to translate in the study as well. That's why this household survey concept is they're very important. And um, in, I don't know in the Nepal case, but in Bangladesh case, what we did we collected primary data for the household survey. Uh, for others, they also use the secondary, but the government data, so that in a comparative way, it could be done. So, very interestingly, the study findings, um, when they gave us, I don't understand the technical things, now how the methodology and many things, but what I found out, the map when they presented, that where in the country, which part you can get solar, where you can get wind, and where you can get other kind of things. So at least you have a idea where you should really explore, where you can invest, which kind of technology. Before that, we have not have that kind of things. Of course, this map, what they are telling, it is not ground to that. So that the ground verification is also important because the GIS, a satellite image and everything there. But the verification could be done. And from that map, you can also find out that how much land also is required. So because the land question always comes as a big issue in the solar uh, PV installations. And what we learned also that um, basically this kind of scenario development the timeline is very important, and you also have to be uh, some kind of assumption of the technological breakthroughs. Although in our scenarios, we don't really uh, incorporate the technological breakthroughs, just usual technological development processes focused on. Um, but we have seen the battery calculation and uh, other things, even in Bangladesh case, could be even much improved when we did that, and I think in the Nepal case. So the Bangladesh uh, study, uh, we did also another thing. Basically, we put the whole study team in the actual field area before going to the analysis and other things. Because our intention is, if the modelers, they see 
the actual geographic setting and how people are living in different setups. So they can have much more cluster of the households, much more cluster of the urban, semi-urban peripheries. And what that helped, because when they see the land constants, one-fifth of the Bangladesh solar potential is basically the floating solar. So this is an idea, and no agricultural land is consulted for this um, Bangladesh calculation, no forest land. And we found that only 0.5% land is required for the solar things, and 1% for the onshore wind. And the uh, study basically highlighted the offshore wind potential that was not even in our concern. So um, what I have learned, uh, basically this process that renewable energy development is geomorphology based. The geographic setting is the very important. You cannot really, you can develop a coal power plant in anywhere parameter, but the renewable energy context, you have to based on the natural setting. And that really um, is a critical for things. And that's why maybe the, uh, even within the country, the uh, energy sharing concept in the provincial level or divisional level is also very important. And also I found that my idea was maybe the hills could be very important. Uh, helpful for the wind energy things, but unfortunately, the, in Bangladesh context, our whole hilly region is very highly potential for the solar, not for the wind. I so this is also a very interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm oh, really oh, thank sorry, you. But I hope there will be time to further discuss this later in the Q and A session. But thank you very much for your input. This is a great example of how important actually technical scenarios really is to have an efficient and effective renewable energy deployment that is really adjusted and tailored to the ge geographical circumstances of each country, which is unique in every country. I would like to move forward um, to Mr. Manush. With your experience of supporting, oh yeah, yeah for sure. With your experience, there's a presentation. With your experience of, of uh, supporting six regions in India to develop and implement technical scenarios and action plans, I would like to hear from you how to move forward to really implement this into policies and to how, how useful are technical scenarios to develop policies. And if you would like also to compare your experience across the regions, if there was any differences, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, PRC, for giving me this opportunity, uh, uh, co-panelist and, and dear friends. So um, I'm not going to talk about the method because uh, it's already said and done. But I will say uh, the methodology of uh, mainstreaming this uh, scenario-based approach or scientific approach of doing multi-sectoral planning. Because uh, ultimately, energy is a concurrent subject in India, particularly there is a state uh, central level policies, plans, target, like you all know, 500 gigawatt, this, that. And then uh, there are real actors uh, uh, as a state machinery. And they have to stop or allow you to go with certain speed in certain directions. So we have realized that we need to help state. Uh, but again, a state doesn't mean only renewable energy department or uh, uh, energy department or transmitter or distributor. Uh, it's all a demand sector and supply sector. But unfortunately, when you go into the field, you will understand that uh, demand sector assume that energy is my birthright. I will demand as and when farmer will demand to me or transport sector will demand to me. And uh, energy sector has to provide energy at certain rate. If not possible, then state government has to put subsidy or I'll, I'll beg it from um, central government. But this way things don't go. Morning also we had a, a, a detailed discussion that why even after having a good policy in place, things are not moving. And uh, same thing in India. In certain state, things are moving at uh, Mac 2 speed and certain area it is just not moving, even after having a policy in place for 8-10 years. So GIZ, um, is active very much in the energy cluster. We are having several 
projects, all four-year, five-year, three million, four million kind of things. So we have an institutional memory and capacity, both technical as well as process-related thing. So um, we thought, why not to give a wholehearted support to few selected state uh, so that they can take everything. Because if you say uh, EV uh, program, then uh, considering the budget, probably they can only reach out to few state. So I thought, let's give an honest try to support and understand how uh, things can be mainstream. Uh, so the process we took is first to have a formal MOU uh, with the state, because they are the owner. If we develop something and park it there, they, it will remain in their uh, drawer. So uh, we had a MOU at as apex level as possible. In state case, it is a state uh, uh, chief secretary. Uh, and they may park it in renewable energy department or energy department. And then we form a PMU. And PMU is project management unit where representation from all departments should be there. And the number of department in most of the cases are 15 to 18 department. Even education department, just listen. But I think uh, after having Sri Lanka's presentation, I think uh, they can play a proactive role uh, to sensitize uh, consumer. Then co-ownership from day one, we don't hold a meeting unless until we ensure that at least 60-70% PMU members are or can attend on that very day then HR and admin related support, and these are all meticulously written in that MOU. Uh, and these MOUs are different from uh, each uh, districts. And, and then strategic and political uh, decisions at basic time, uh, for example, six uh, method or six major steps uh, my previous speaker uh, mentioned. At every step we have to consolidate uh, whether baseline you are agree with that, you are validating data, then only we will go forward. And GIZ is basically providing technical support as a uh, home tutor kind of thing. And then technical capacity building and also implementation support. There are two important points, which is data scenario and action plan, energy plan, and there is a repetition of that thing. So we'll bring different scenario, go to different department, unless until they accept it is not our baby that we'll finalize it. And then once the plan is there, it is not once for final, so it is supposed to be implemented. So while implementation, they will get some learning, and they can again change it into the Excel sheet or on the model, uh, the software, uh, so that they can have another plan. So it's basically shifting from incremental plan to very long-term plan, and uh, a plan by energy department shifting to multi-sectoral planning. Under this process, uh, the prerequisite is vision. So we all started uh, with the state existing vision, their uh, SDG vision, and their SAPCC uh, commitment. And then sectoral integration, planning methodology, so they should understand what type of data they have to provide, whether we will share this thing or not, but they have to provide, unless until they provide data, we'll take either national uh, average or uh, data from similar uh, state, but we will not going to assume any data uh, from our end if it is available with them. Then technology adoption, cost benefit, lateral impact, uh, like job creation and all those things, future fuel and technology, if certain things are not known, for example, cost of hydrogen fuel, if it is not known, we have created that cell, but we have not put data. Maybe two years, three years after when we'll have some market-related data, we'll put that data, and they can again revise this thing. Uh, resource utilization, uh, trained and case studies. So even to take certain decision which a state has not uh, taken so far, so we have uh, sensitized them through different case studies so that they can understand what they are agreeing with. And then policy and regulation, all their policies and all their uh, all uh, the regulations be it state level regulation or uh, national level or international level, which we have signed and agreed to, uh, has been considered under this. And then institutional capacity building, I mentioned that thing as well. So this, this process, uh, and believe me, while developing this thing, we have around 60 to 70 round of discussion with joint secretary, special secretary, principal secretary level of people. In case of Goa, it was very easy because it is a small 
and people don't have that much public uh, interaction or uh, they're very cohesive, uh, like open door kind of thing. Uh, baseline, uh, uh, as, as uh, I was uh, considering this thing, earlier uh, they were saying by 2030 will become 100%. But while uh, doing one or two round of scenario assessment, we have realized uh, electricity sector, it is possible uh, to go green because Goa is hardly generating any, uh, any energy from within, uh, although they have uh, resources available uh, within uh, the state, but they basically purchase. So even if they uh, um, go for new set of um, uh, power purchase agreement, uh, probably they can uh, consider uh, or, or convert themselves as a uh, net zero, uh, sorry, 100% renewable electricity. But if we consider all other sector, uh, then probably it will take time. So uh, we have also shown them uh, what are the sector which is consuming or growing at what rate, uh, then urbanization uh, rate, tourist uh, sector is the major sector in Goa, how much it is growing, then during COVID period when there was no tourist, what is the dynamic so that we can understand what is the absolute influence of uh, tourist across different sector, and these are all data. So no theory, no assumptions, unless until we have data uh, going into the system, coming out of the system. Then we show them what are the GHG emission and per sector wise, what they have to uh, reduce, to convert it uh, themselves as a net zero kind of things. Because Goa is uh, fully dependent on uh, tourist inflow and they are trying to uh, position themselves on the green uh, tour, uh, this thing, uh, as a green uh, tourist hotspot uh, uh, globally. So these are the sector, and you can see uh, transport sector and electricity sector. Uh, that their 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 um, growth rate is humongous uh, for all practical reasons. Uh, there is fuel shifting happening, or proposed uh, more and more uh, um, areas are. Uh, explore as a different kind of uh, tourist for different kind of tourist. Then Goa, like any other geography, have different state weakness opportunity. We have factor in all those things, particularly their land availability. In Goa, uh, around 82% area you cannot access. Either they are coastal, uh, under coastal regulatory zone, or biosphere, or biodiversity kind of thing, elephant corridor, trigger corridor, so not. Uh, different type of things. So we have factored in all those things and uh, we convert them into uh, our uh, data uh, relevant for energy calculations. Then for um, uh, electricity sector, uh, sorry, um, for renewable, um, these are uh, proven uh, or, or uh, given uh, data by MNRE approved by the state. So we have taken that thing. Although there are different other potential like uh, a role integra uh, road integrated, rail integrated, floating solar. Uh, since those estimations were not there, we have not considered it right now. But these are uh, next implementation phase related assignment. I'm, I'm sorry, we have, sorry. have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, options we have given then, either you go for a 100% RE without having any cost constraint. Earlier they agreed, then when they uh, come to know about the gigantic financial investment figure uh, uh, they uh, withdraw. Then emission based, uh, sometime it is possible. For some sector it is just not possible because of different practical constant. Efficiency, so we have considered end users to resource uh, primary, secondary, and every stage there are losses. Uh, for example, for thermal application in industry, if you go for solar uh, PV and then use it for thermal application, actually the planner is doing something wrong. Uh, solar can be directly used as a thermal uh, technology. Then social impact like job creation, uh, um, uh, resource utilization, uh, MSW, um, um, pollution, uh, education. And then based on that thing, what are the uh, plan they have to do? And this is agreed, uh, particularly by electricity department. And they have already initiated work, so probably uh, 30 by 30, whatever we are saying over here, uh, that they will achieve. Probably they will achieve more. Then uh, skill, because this is not one-time assignment uh, by some external agency like GIZ. 
they have to live with that, they have to change it, they have to use it. So we have done a detailed skill requirement for 100% RE. So uh, all departments, major departments, and uh, uh, divided into four, technical, program management, commercial, and analytical things. And we have rated who need what type of just. <laughs> Uh, then topic-wise, because it is not a skill gap assessment, you have to provide, bridge that gap. So what are the type of technology or other things? Uh, so we have to now start one after another training uh, for respective stakeholder or actor. Um, and we are also talking to different state, all six state I have mentioned for Goa, I'm specifying smart city, they are actively acting on that urban uh, um, transport and urban and power uh, department is very active to put uh, RE thing as a priority and they have taken inlet water transport as a priority and within this year they will going to convert all their diesel based uh, thing to a uh, EV or, uh, or, or uh, hybrid mode. Uh, then fishery, RE and now they are also saying why not uh, tourist because this is having uh, interaction with all other departments. So I was talking to uh, a Maldiv uh, colleague. Uh, so probably we need more information how through tourist uh, or tourism department we can reach out to different department and influence each other. M Mr. Manoj, I'm really yeah. sorry. We would, no. I would love to continue during the Q&A. Um, and thank you for the presentation. I think this is also a great uh, uh, way to show how even within a country, there is a huge variety of renewable energy potential. And I think technical scenarios are a great approach to assure a long-term efficiency of renewable energy deployment, even within one state. And I would now have a look, I would like to have a look at, uh, at the participatory aspect of preparing a technical scenario. And I would like to move on to you, Arati, with your experience as part of the 100% renewable energy map project in Nepal. I would like to hear from you how it is possible to involve stakeholders and also what the importance is of having multi-actors participate in the process of developing a technical scenario. Thank you, Selma. Um, so in case of Nepal, uh, if you compare with um, uh, what uh, our esteemed panelists have just mentioned in their country, in our case it's just prepared. Uh, we haven't finalized it, but a draft uh, version of uh, technical scenario is already present. And uh, there was a learning actually from uh, one of our uh, project team uh, which is uh, World Future Council. Uh, World Future Council was already preparing uh, technical scenarios for Bangladesh and Tanzania. And one of the main learning uh, was to have uh, a participatory approach, having all the uh, actors uh, who are able to promote renewable energy uh, to be engaged in uh, technical scenario preparation because afterwards when the technical scenario is prepared, all the uh, pathways that has to be fulfilled are realized by different stakeholders itself. So taking that learning um, in our project, which is itself a, a multi-actor partnership, 100% RE, for implementing NDCs in Global South. So in Nepal, uh, under this project, uh, this MAPS 100% RE project, a uh, technical scenario was uh, prepared. So uh, in our, uh, through our project, a platform was actually uh, formed, uh, which included um, different stakeholders from government uh, to private sector uh, to academia and even those uh, representing youth and women including me there so uh, the idea was to have a platform and that platform would actually discuss on various possibilities of promoting renewable uh, energy in our country with the vision of 100 percent re so we knew that map would be actively engaged for preparation of technical scenario and the, the question was how would would be possible. So we discussed uh, different methodologies that could, we could actually adopt. So it included from having a, a workshop model to bilateral meetings and get it reviewed. So first we started uh, with uh, the MLAT. Uh, we usually have a MAP meeting 
uh, uh, usually f at least three to four times a year. So in one of the MAP meeting, one of the agenda was to start uh, the technical scenario by defining what renewable energy is, because there is still a discussion on if we need to consider hydropower as renewable or not, and there are another new renewables coming. So, to, uh, so based upon the description, that uh, definition of renewable, uh, which is uh, presented by Alternative Energy Promotion Center of the Government of Nepal. So based on that, and again, discussion with everyone, uh, within the map platform, we decided that um, we'll consider renewables, we'll have the target of 100% renewables, but then renewables has to be defined into two categories. First will be the conventional renewables, uh, which is hydropower, because we can't neglect hydropower because it is the basis of uh, electricity in our country, and it is, and government has also planned for you know increasing the number of dams, number of hydroelectricity projects. So we had this hydropower, and then we have new renewables. So this new renewables means solar, and even microgrid, mini-grid, and hydrogen, and other um, technologies. So from the definition, then we started with uh, analyzing of how we can reach to 100% uh, renewable energy by 2050. Then we started a specific uh, meeting uh, with MAP uh, discussing on uh, the technical scenario. So what we did was we had Sven with us, uh, as well as uh, World Future Council, representative from World Future Council, who actually presented uh, the experience of technical scenario in other countries and also provided the rationale as to why uh, we need to prepare a technical scenario. And then Sven um, introduced the different methodologies that would be followed. So that was the first time with MAP members, they actually heard about technical scenario and what kind of you know, data input they can provide uh, during the process. Then after that, then we had this bilateral meeting. We had first meeting with United Nations Development uh, Program um, because uh, as um, in yesterday uh, presentation, we could see uh, UN was um, actively involved in preparing this long-term strategy for net zero emission by 2045. So we wanted to discuss with uh, UNDPS, uh, you know, where we can build on to uh, what there's already been done and how we can actually provide an additional value to it. So. Uh, we discussed and uh, what uh, conclusion that we drawn was uh, we'll, we will build on the long-term strategy, we'll take on the reference uh, scenario uh, which the long-term st uh, strategy has already prepared, we'll also be considering the with existing uh, measures scenario, WM scenario, which is already present in the uh, long-term strategy for net zero emission and that's how there was no duplication in activities in what we are doing. Then we again had a very specific me meeting again with very selective uh, members within the map determine the tools and guidelines that could be used for data generation. And then uh, we reached out to MAP members when there was a requirement of data. And uh, uh, for example, for transmission uh, grids, we uh, reached out to our uh, Nepal Electricity Authority. And then um, there was even a Clean Cooking Alliance who'd already prepared maps. So um, they provided us with those kind of information. So we reached out to different MAP members uh, to fulfill the data gaps. Then after all the information was there, a draft uh, was prepared, which even Sven already presented. So that uh, draft was again reviewed by um, MAP members, um, which consist of again CSOs, uh, also academia, even experts. So they reviewed all the data, they validated, and after that we now have uh, uh, again, a uh, draft version of um, the technical scenario, which we are going, to, we are planning to launch it by this December. So this is how we prepared uh, our technical scenario. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very insightful presentation of how important uh, it is to involve multi-actors and how effective it is to not only work alone on something but also together to have different aspects uh, and, and knowledge involved in preparing a document that will be used for the well-being of the country and hopefully also the entire world. Um, we will end this session 10 minutes earlier to have enough time for everyone to have a break and to refresh our minds. So that's why we only have 10 more minutes and I would like to invite the audience for those 10 more minutes to provide us with your opinion, your expertise or your question to the panel. We have already one question over there. Can we please give him a mic?
I would like to ask uh, Indian delegates about, as all of we know that uh, RE is not a reliable source of energy. So from the point of energy security, what is the idea behind 100% RE uh, as you mentioned in the example of Goa? So how you ensure the availability of RE energy as, uh, there, as per our requirement or demand? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would probably collect if there are more questions, maybe two or three more questions. Yes, please, gentlemen in the front. Thank you. Uh, this is Siddiq Zubair from Bangladesh. My question is uh, to Professor Tusky. Uh, I think you hear me. Uh, that uh, you conducted this study for Nepal and uh, how much accuracy you are expecting from this study of 100% renewable because you see that if I say that wind that G these are the GIS based mapping so if you really go for setting up any wind project that you need uh, on-site MATMAS based data collection for make it bankable. So what is your uh, accuracy, expectancy of accuracy from this study? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one question in the front. Thank you very much. Mine also goes to uh, Professor Zvin. I don't know if he's still online. Um, so with regards to the assumptions that we made while uh, undertaking this study, are there key documents that we considered? Where did the assumptions, where were they originating from? Uh, number one. Number two, um, is, is it, did he use a software for the analysis? If, if he did, is it, is it accessible? Where can we get it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Yes, please. I would take that question, then we can move on to answering. Thank you. Uh, this is Navraj Rakal from APC, and my question is to Mr. Manoj uh, Mahata from India. Um, I'm especially interested on his uh, this. Eighty step uh, cyclical process uh, where uh, they define this prerequisites for uh, energy transition together with the state governments. So I would like to uh, know a little, little more about how, how this has started and uh, have you already sort of uh, implemented the scenarios you develop for certain uh, states? Uh, so that it has already produced the result or, or how far have you been and how the resource sharing things have been defined into that uh, scenario planning so that, that that details I'm a bit interested because it's, it's a similar situation here in Nepal after we uh, change our system into federal system now we have seven uh, provincial governments actually the relevant ministries who are working in the energy sector are also participated in this conference and we have similar MOUs that you, uh, as, as you mentioned there, with the ministries at the province level. And we are trying to help the ministries at the province level to come up with the similar scenario and implement uh, currently. The main focus is on the excess side, but of course, I mean, when we see energy transition in totality, uh, this will be really helpful for us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we would now move on to, to answering, and I would like to start with Sven, Mr. Professor Sven, if you can hear us, please. Get, um, can you hear us? Hear you? Y yes. Hello, hello? Hello, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Um, um, I start um, with the accuracy in terms of um, our projections. Sorry to interrupt. Please uh, just 
make sure that your answer will be like one, one and a half minutes, so we're still in the scope of time. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, short and sharp. Um, for um, solar uh, mapping, it is um, it's quite accurate. Uh, it's probably not, it's not bankable, but it's quite accurate because uh, the variations of solar are less um, so than for wind. For wind, um, we basically uh, identify a, a search area, but then the next step is to actually have um, on-site um, research as well. We can't do that with the desktop research, but um, for solar, it's quite accurate. For wind, uh, you need to have more uh, sort of regional studies. Um, in terms of um, the assumptions, we identified all the assumptions uh, for the, for the um, modeling, uh, which is documented in the report, which will be published. So that's a fairly um, open process. We also publish all the data we uh, generate. So basically, we have an open uh, data policy that we will provide um, all our results, and uh, we provide all the assumptions. The software um, is um, property of the of, of the of our university, so it's not an open source um, software. But uh, we have very transparent data and assumption uh, documentation. And I think did I forget? Is there another? Was there another question? I'm not sure. I no, I think I think the questions to you um, you have perfectly answered them. We can now move on to you, Syria. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, first question is uh, renewable. Uh, it's it's not very static. Uh, nothing is static. Uh, and uh, renewable, everybody asks that question very first. Um, so in our case, uh, it was a uh, open system uh, developed by KTH uh, Sweden. Uh, and in the beauty of this uh, uh, modeling system, it is uh, a load flow uh, is incorporated in this. Uh, that means to say uh, we have 8760 data point uh, each uh, hour uh, of a year. And then we have three different season and uh, three slot a day, a morning, uh, day, and evening. And then uh, working day and non-working day. So that we, and we have three, four sample uh, feeders so that we can understand what are the uh, consumption pattern, uh, and that will give us how much uh, storage we need if we uh, introduce X amount of uh, solar or a Y amount of uh, wind or something, and that model can uh, calculate that thing. And as far as storage is concerned, it is not what uh, government will do. For example, in case of Goa, they have almost signed an uh, PPA with uh, on uh, uh, um, 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 round the clock uh, power. So whomsoever managing it at their level, but Goa will going to get a round the clock uh, supply from renewable sources. That is one. Second is grid tie uh, battery storage. They are now doing. Uh, pre-feasibility technical assessment uh, so that they can uh, put it at their own cost. Third is uh, the vehicle. Uh, EV is going to take huge amount of your energy store during peak, peak time, uh, sorry, off peak time, and that is again your pricing policy. When you are allowing customer to use energy at lower rate so that they can fill their tank. In this case, this is battery. And fourth thing is uh, uh, the industry. Industry is also trying to uh, develop different technology. For example, solar thermal application uh, to replace a boiler and other thing, um, either run by other fuel or electricity, so that they can also shift to other technology. Uh, and, and this is how uh, the moment you will have a wider portfolio of ingredient, uh, that pizza will be liked by some or the other people. Um, mix match kind of solution. Second is prerequisite. Uh, I don't know Nepal state, uh, but in India, unless until you are violating any policy at off national level or uh, international level, you can do your bit of policy at state level. For example, Goa was asking us to develop uh, district level planning. But in district level, actually, it is a distribution planning. And it is not a very long term planning, because district doesn't have legal authority to do their policy. 
Only uh, municipal corporation can do little bit of alteration as far as uh, MSW or other kind of thing. Uh, so as far as state is concerned, and in our case, it is validated uh, uh, by state. All major steps or decision, intermediate decisions are validated by state. If, if in province level you have a separate capable uh, legal entity of the state who can make their own plan and assessment and policy and program, uh, then it's always better to give them uh, uh, author, uh, responsibility to do their plan because that, that then that plan will be used uh, at national level. For example, in 2018, uh, Niti Aayog uh, has developed IESS 2047. It is national level energy projection calculator. And we have used the state level because that will complement the national level policy in, in far more uh, competitive manner or complementary manner. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is just how state and, uh, and, and there is a political dimension also. Uh, although I don't know whether I should say it or not, uh, at uh, national level there is one government. Uh, all states are having different, different political party run government. So that dynamics also play a role. If it is the same government, then probably there will be a flow of information, resources, permission uh, to state level more efficiently than in other cases. So we factor in all those cases. And in uh, six state I am working, there are four different type of government. So I, I need to understand those dynamics as well, and we have incorporated those. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we have reached the end of our session. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, before I completely stop, I would like to ask Arati and Mr. Masum if you want to have any final message. Yeah, please. 30 seconds, if possible. Uh, because 100% uh, are you, when you are talking, uh, even the existing RE projects, hmm? most are not 100% RE. Because the utility scale, they have to use this diesel generator. Or they use diesel generator to save the battery cost. No, so, the, so this is a point we also highlighted. Because 100% RE means even you are doing a renewable energy project, it has to be 100% renewable energy based. No, no diesel and fossil fuel huh? as a backup uh, capacity. And another thing we have learned that 100% RE, if it is, does not incorporate cooking option, it will not really benefit the women. The burden of the women in our region for a cooking purpose, especially in the rural area, only lighting will not enlighten their life. So we have to really, when you provide the renewable energy, renewable electricity, it electricity has to be also for cooking as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for your participation and for listening and joining us in this session. I will now move on to Raju. Thank you very much. Uh, you may want to have a photo. Uh, Salma, you want, to, you want to stand for a photo? Thank you very much, uh, Salma, for this uh, very exciting uh, session. I know that it was a bit technical, I guess but also a very important session. Probably we'll have to build on this and have more further uh, discussion to really dissect and digest these uh, aspects. But this is something very key if we want to really uh, think about a future to going forward with the 100% renewable energy. With that, uh, what I would like to request is now we have uh, one final technical session before we move on to the closing session. So in this uh, final session is on addressing social inclusion and gender equity in just uh, energy transition. And this is a very important aspect. Since yesterday we have been saying that, just looking at a part of providing, generating uh, energy or providing energy is not sufficient, but the inclusion part, just engagement, I mean uh, the inclu social inclusion or let's say participatory process of uh, communities, gender aspect, um, in indigenous peoples, communities, everybody is very key, or private sector as well, and researchers, to move towards this uh, uh, you know, direction. In order to achieve that, of course, this will be a very key aspect. So we also want to see, if we want to move towards the, what kind of role other, uh, let's say, the gender and social dimensions really has 
in terms of moving toward a just uh, transition. That's what we're going to discuss. But before going straight away to the technical session, what I would ask you to do is, in less than 10 minutes, I just want you to go and grab a uh, cup of tea or coffee and come back. So uh, then, of course, we'll also set up our uh, session here. And the, the next session will be taken by Nithi from uh, Malaysia, who is also the uh, Director and Regional Coordinator for Climate Action, Southeast Asia. He will uh, lead us uh, through this final technical session. Yeah? So I guess uh, this is a, it was a session immediately after the lunch. It might have been a little uh, difficult and also very heavy and technical session. So please uh, grab a cup of coffee or tea and then come back in 10 minutes we start the session.